Today I'm going to talk about the context of decarbonisation and what it means, examine some lessons that I think will serve us to help us understand how we can plot a way forward. And then I'm going to talk about some issues that might be in our way. I'll talk then about the technology that's out there and what it can do for us and then make some suggestions about some steps we can take to realise our potential. And then I'll conclude. The context of this presentation and the focus is on decarbonisation of our economies by 2050. Ursula von der Leyen, in her maiden speech, declared that she wanted Europe to become the first climate neutral continent in the world by 2050. Quite an ambition. To make this happen, we must take bold steps together. I totally agree. Bold steps are really needed. But talk is easy and actions are more difficult. They need resources and clever actions need a vision to guide them. Electricity, for me, must be the vector for decarbonising our economies competitively on efficiency grounds alone. And the question is, is, can Europe, can Ireland, can the world take these bold steps? Hi, so now I have my glasses to talk about the Green Deal. The Clean Plan for All 1.5 tech scenario calls for 2000 gigawatts of renewables, mostly wind and solar. That's an incredible amount of renewables. And these renewables are mostly in remote locations, even in the offshore. We have the technology, uh, we have good solar, uh, we have great offshore wind. The challenge is in bringing it to market. In 2020, the Florence School of Regulation produced a report, and the authors, um, Andreas P. Balx, the former commissioner, of Energy and Christopher Jones, the head of cabinet for DG Energy in the European Commission. So these are people who know who know about energy and the administration of energy portfolios. And they opine that the most important and immediate priority for the European Union in ensuring a cost effective decarbonisation of its energy system must therefore be to identify and eliminate infrastructure and other bottlenecks that are likely to constrain the cost effective production and the use of renewable electricity moving forward. What they're really saying is the infrastructure to bring the renewable generation which is there and available to market is the biggest threat to achieving an orderly transition that's economic and leaves Europe being competitive. As we plot our way towards 2050, it's insightful to learn a little bit about where we've come from to help us understand the challenges we face. For me, there are two or three lessons. Firstly, we pool electrical resources. We've done so from local to national level at the very beginning of electricity. And that is still necessary and economic. Secondly, a big crisis, a big trigger, can get us policy response. This happened in the 70s with the oil crisis when we moved away from oil dependency to coal, gas, but most importantly we started developing renewable generation. The gas system was substantially overhauled, the electricity system was largely fit for purpose. The third big lesson for me is when generation and supply were opened up to competition by the European Union under Directive 9692. That really opens the door to competition in generation and supply, and most importantly, allowing innovation to drive down and competition to drive down prices. So we saw renewables coming on board, and then we saw them crash. The price went way below fossil fuels and subsidies were no longer required, but also the scale increased from kilowatts to megawatts and now to gigawatts where two gigawatt wind farms, three gigawatt wind farms are commonly developed in the North Sea. Climate change is questioned today because it's not like an oil crisis. Nobody denies it, it's happened. But climate change still has deniers out there, despite all the evidence we see. And we have to accept that today's interests are being prioritised over tomorrow's well-being. It's a fact of life. So, that's the past. What are the issues with today? Well, the most efficient way to decarbonise our economies is with electricity. 
they could increase their share from on average about 25% of the energy mix to being 75% of the total energy mix. That's quite a lot. That's a two to three fold increase in electricity usage. And for me, that is the purpose of networks in the future, to make that possible. Most renewable resources are not connected to markets. They're in peripheral areas and the markets we have are not sufficiently interconnected. We don't really have a single energy market in Europe. Some countries are long in renewables, while others don't have enough to develop. Energy is a devolved national competency, but few countries can do it by themselves. A point-to-point -point patchwork approach is being developed, and it will become unworkable well before we ever reach 2000 gigawatts or our 2050 targets. For me, the logic of the network has never been greater. To pool the resources has never been more compelling, but it must be applied at an international level, not just at national level. That won't work for renewables. Electricity transmission and distribution is slow moving, insular and nationalized, where innovation is quite often seen as more of a threat than an opportunity. Our existing and planned grids are not fit for the purpose. We are not working together sufficiently to develop the networks we need to power our economies cleanly, securely and competitively. In short, we have transmission technology research and development, but it's not coming through to demonstration. So what is possible? I think to discover what is possible, we should really look to China. China has been the leader in innovation and transmission in recent years, particularly in DC trans transmission. This is Zhangbai, a four terminal DC network that connects renewable resources to the capital of Beijing, where there's a three gigawatt station. You can see this is going to be expanded in 2021 to a seven node DC network. So they have not abandoned their AC network, they have simply overlaid it with an additional capacity in the form of a DC network. This is the future of transmission technology for moving remote renewables long distance to market. In China, they have multi-terminal networks. That's the second one. They also use DC breakers, which we fretted about for a decade or two in Europe. Their DC circuits are operated like autobahns, moving power of up to 10 gigawatts and beyond over long distances, while the AC system below carries local traffic. Their scale enables inter-regional transmission within country at a scale never seen heretofore. They appear to see their network as something evolving to meet their economic needs and not as an immovable fixture. The largest circuit alone has a capacity of 12 gigawatts and is 3,324 kilometers in length, representing 40,000 gigawatt kilometers of bulk power transfer. It's a DC line, it's quite unique. This is the same infrastructure, it's a picture of uh, one of the pylons. So you can see it's quite enormous. And the workers on the left doing some work on one of the poles. It's hard to see this working for us in Europe, but we do need a similar scale bulk power transfer. Europe needs a different approach, but we can draw inspiration from the examples the Chinese have given us as to what is possible with meshing, with DC power, with bulk power transfer. But we need something that is more publicly acceptable and deployable in a marine setting like the North Sea. An integrated DC grid or meshed is the future for integrating renewables at the scale required. This requires a plan and an international cooperation for a pan-European grid. None of the European countries are of a scale where we can do this by ourselves. These are the bold steps which we need to take. This is an excerpt from a presentation given by E3G several weeks ago. In it, they compare the cost of a radial network in Europe compared to an integrated or meshed network. You can see the cost savings are quite substantial, 50%. And the scenario can change and the cost can change, but the principle is becoming accepted as a no-brainer. We need a meshed or integrated network for Europe, not just in the North Sea, 
we need it for the rest of Europe for when the wind doesn't blow. The question is, is what technologies can best help us to do this? This brings me nicely to superconductors. I will explain briefly what they are. So superconductors are materials, and unlike copper or aluminium, they have no resistance. So there are no losses. If you put in 100 units, you get out 100 units. So they're very efficient. However, in order for them to be superconducting, they must be cooled below their critical temperature. For that, you can use liquid nitrogen, liquid hydrogen, and some other cryogens. The European Commission sponsored a program called Best Paths, and in 2018, they found that gigawatt scale superconducting cables are technologically mature, cost competitive for transmission of large amounts of electricity, thanks to their high efficiency compact size and reduced environmental impact, they are more likely to find public acceptance than overhead lines and conventional cables. On your left you can see the scale, so the small conductor on the left can carry five times as much current as the conductor on the right, you also see it compared to a one euro coin. Superconductors are used today in our power systems, in niche applications, typically in urban settings where space is at a premium and traditional copper and aluminium technology cannot meet the need or cannot meet it economically. The cost of a superconductor, however, is largely fixed, so whether it's a small bulk power transfer or a very large bulk power transfer, the scale does not increase significantly, so the cost advantage and the benefits of using a superconductor are much, much greater at larger powers. At 6 to 12 gigawatts links in Europe per China, there is no realistic alternative to HVDC superconductors. You can see from the graph on your right, when you get up towards 10 gigawatts, the cost of a superconducting link is a fraction of the cost of traditional links. Some of our best renewable resources in Europe are to be found in a marine setting. In Supernode, we're developing the technology, improving its thermal performance and extending its range and use case so that it can be used over longer distances and particularly so that it can be used in a marine setting. In 2020, we were delighted to receive a statement of feasibility from DNVGL for our subsea superconducting cable system, our world first. I believe this technology can be a big game changer and enable renewables from remote locations to be connected to markets. So some suggestions to realize our future. Firstly, we should aim towards 2050 and have a view of what that looks like and what it will take to get there and not focus too much on interim targets alone. We have to have the end game in sight here. To that end, we should have a single European entity charged with developing the network the infrastructure we need for our energy system, an architect without assets. We should reverse the trend, it won't serve us, of individual member states trying to do their own thing. Very few countries can do this by themselves and few if any can do it economically. Most can't do it at all. The type of innovation we need is not just innovation that fixes a problem today, addresses a market problem. It should be innovation that can shape the future. Innovation that enables tomorrow, market shaping grid innovation, and we should avoid closed shop innovation in transmission in particular. It's a closed market, the preserve of utilities and TSOs. We need to get the private sector in there. We need to start funding and supporting transmission innovation as we did with generation. The results were quite astounding in generation. They should equally be good in transmission. We should see our existing systems as a springboard not as an immovable feast. So in conclusion and as a takeaway, I would say that collectively we need to be more ambitious in terms of what electricity can do for us. Our industry needs to be more ambitious and more confident and open to change. Renewable generation technology is not a constraint. It is available and competitive in abundance to power our economies. We know that electrification is the most efficient and economic way to decarbonize. Electricity networks, though, are not where they need to be, and they're not on track to be where they need to be. Political impetus is required to change the order of things in terms of mindset and openness to new ways and new technologies. We need an international approach. 
We need cooperation, a single energy market, a real single energy market, with an integrated pan-European grid to underpin that market, based upon DC technology. And in Supernode, we believe that superconducting technology can be the building block for such a grid in Europe. Thank you.